Hey, thank you. This is the uh, LRC meeting of uh, July 16th. Thank you guys for being here. Uh oh. Is uh, that me? That was me. Sorry. The vet's calling. Um, sorry about that. Um, I would like us to uh, just discuss for approval the minutes of our last meeting, which was May 21. And I would like to update at the bottom of it where it says the next LRC meeting is scheduled for June 18. I would like us to, if the committee agrees, to add that it was canceled due to the rescheduling of our budget, budget approval being June 25th. Do we have a motion about the meetings and about that amendment? So sure. moved. Second. Second by Mike. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. Um, and thank you for the detailed uh, minutes. It really helped me remember where we were for today. Um, we have one topic. I think the last meeting we decided this one topic that was assigned in March 3rd. And I will let Deborah lead us through from what we talked about wanting to address at this next meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Yes, this uh, topic that was assigned uh, March 3rd has been given top priority for the LRC. So I believe the hope is that we'll be able to continue the conversation, address some concerns that commission, uh, that part of the LRC uh, brought to light last meeting. And that primarily will engage um, Attorney Sherry Hines, and she will take it from here in a moment and address some of the concerns that were discussed last time. And at the conclusion of the conversation, I think we are looking to determine what the next steps are or if we're prepared to then move forward to a, a full recommendation to the Mayor Commission. Ms. Hines? Sure, thank you. Um, so I think there were a couple of things that came out that I'd like to kind of address. So one of them is that Commissioner Parker at the last meeting had asked if we could put together um, kind of a brief public mem memo since the memo that I sent previously was a attorney client confidential privilege memo, just because of all the, the detailed research that we had done on it. Um, you know, I actually talked to Commissioner Parker after uh, the last meeting and in talking to Judd and in trying, and, and I've written a draft, it's just unfortunately not a very good one um, because it's very hard, I think, to write a, a public facing memo that can can adequately discuss the concerns without then waiving um, our privilege. And, and I think there's important reasons to have that privilege in this conversation. Um, so after talking to Judd, we just decided that it wasn't really possible for us to, to write an adequate um, public facing memo that would that would give the public an, an adequate understanding of, of the details that you all were considering. Um, so we don't have that today. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, um, and this was Commissioner Thornton had asked for this, and I apologize, this one just has not gone out because of just everything else we've been doing. We hadn't had a chance to review it. Um, but I talked to Judd about it a few moments ago, and I am happy to kind of give you guys some guidance on that issue. And and as a, just as a refresher, um, what she had asked was whether we could modify, pass an ordinance that would also prevent discrimination based on past criminal history. Uh, and, and in researching that, I, I think, and obviously she's not here to, to say exactly where that came from, but it appears that there's, there's a growing movement in a number of states, I think 13 states. Um, at least I'm, Sherry, I'm here, I'm here, I'm listening. Oh, well, oh good. Okay, hi, Um But it was, I'm wondering if part of the question came from this ban the box movement that is passing, and, and it's the idea of states passing legislation that bans that box that people typically would check off in employment applications that says, you know, that they've been convicted of a, a felony or of a crime in the past. Um, and so that has happened in 13 other states, but Georgia is not one of them. Um, you know, unfortunately, and, and I can see why there are arguments on both sides for this, um, but, you know, Georgia has not proceeded in any any way to make that change. And, and quite frankly, um, evaluating someone's criminal background history is a legal way to, to determine who to hire in Georgia at this time. Um, now that said, the EEOC has put out a lot of guidance about um, how to properly consider criminal background history because it certainly would be illegal to say, uh, not that anyone would have this motivation, I would hope, but to say in your mind, 
I do not want to hire X minority. So I'm going to look at every minority application that comes in. And if they have any uh, criminal history whatsoever, even if it's very, very minor, I'm going to use that criminal history to then as an excuse to not hire that minority. So there is still the potential that someone, an employer could use um, criminal background information in a discriminatory way. And that that is something that someone could go to the EEOC and could file a complaint and could pursue litigation on. But the general concept of saying, hey, you have a theft history. I don't want to hire you as a cashier because I'm concerned that you wouldn't be appropriate for position of trust. That's legal in Georgia. So I don't know if, if that helps answer your question, Commissioner Thornton, or if there was um, more that, that you'd like me to tell you about that. But that's where we are on the issue. Um, that, yeah, that, that pretty much covers it. Um, there's so many criminal justice reforms, um, that are just moving all over the, all over the country. Uh, one of the reasons that another reason that I, I brought that up because I know there is a movement by the justice project around, um, uh, and that's where I, I got some of my information from was from the Justice Project in Atlanta and the work that I've been doing around records restriction. So, um, yeah, I, I guess you probably summed it up for me, but I do know that um, the records there's a new records restriction uh, legislation just passed. I didn't, I, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking with Judge Hope and some other folks to understand what that means and 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 how it does help folk. Unfortunately, it I, uh, unfortunately it's still misdemeanors. Um, a lot of people that I'm working with or know have felonies. Probably should have been a misdemeanor, but it turned out to be a felony. So it, it comes from that and. I just want us to keep looking at ways that people can get a second chance um, with criminal backgrounds. I just want to keep that conversation open and going. Well, uh, Abita, do you think it would be appropriate for our next meeting for us to have a summary of what that legislation is and how uh, that updates that would happen from that? Do you want that? Absolutely. Actually, tomorrow I, I have a conference call, uh, and it had nothing to do with me being a commission. It's almost kind of, I got to be deliberate when I separate my work. Um, we're having a conference call so I can better understand uh, with Georgia Legal Services and Judge Hope what that uh, legislation means or looks at. So, um yeah, let's put it down, and and it, we may it may not mean anything, but let's put it down. If there's something that I can share more legally and from legal minds uh, greater than mine, so yeah, let's put it down. But it it, it may not pan out to be anything. Well, that um, we can use. Right. Well, and and on this same topic, is this the same thing when somebody calls them their job application a felon friendly job application? Is I. It, I, I I don't know. Judges, Judge Hope, does it does that capture I mean, what a, there, there are some companies that advertise themselves as being felon friendly that even if you have to answer that question, they're still going to consider you. Ban the box is that you don't even answer that question until you get to a certain stage. And so my understanding is Clark County's personal HR policy is we are a ban the box employer. And Deborah and Ms. Hines or Ms. Lonan and Ms. Hines may have more information about that. And the state of Georgia has also now banned the box. That's something Governor Deal did, but it's just as to their own hiring practices. It's not a law that they've passed to private employers. Okay. So then maybe, maybe, um, so, and Sherry, you were saying that this is a state level thing. You, that, that as far as the ban the box, it has to be at the state level. And that's. <laughs> That's what I would advise. Yes. I mean, we certainly, as Judge Hope has indicated, we can do anything with our own employment. I mean, and legal, but we certainly yeah. could be in the box if we haven't already. And, and I, I just don't actually know that personally. Um, but as far as mandating anything on individual uh, companies or, or outside entities that, that I would argue we can't do. Right. Well, I, I think that this topic maybe captures right where we are now uh, might capture the way we can discuss things for the non-discrimination 
in making sure that we as a unified government are doing what we can to make sure our employees are not being discriminated against with their public interface. We learned a little bit about uh, the bus drivers potentially and uh, Deborah has details about solid waste downtown. And so just making sure that we can do everything we can. It sounds like we have more ability to do things as an example, as a unified government, than we can mandate the community to do. That's right. And, and I will say that, you know, I, I've been in discussions with Deborah about those two examples you just gave. And, you know, as, a, as an employer, we have a responsibility to ensure that our employees are not subject to, um, you know, dis discrimination and racist treatment, even if that's from the members of the public. How you achieve that is, is often the question. Is that something I know we've been working with solid waste, especially, and I think now with, um, with transit, now that that's been brought to our attention, we'll be addressing it. Um, and that's totally separate. I mean, that's an entirely separate legal obligation that we already have that's unrelated to any ordinance that we may pass moving forward. I think Commissioner Wright may be having technical um, issues, so I don't want to proceed too much further until she's able to get back on. Um, Commissioner Thornton, did you have any additional questions about the research you'd asked of Attorney Hines? No, and I think um, I just put it out there. I guess um, I guess the, the the thing is to make. To, um, I think it was Josh that might have said that we are, you know, the local government is. Um, I forgot the word friendly. Whatever the word is, selling friendly. Selling friendly, or is so, uh, and so is so. I guess my question. I think I heard. Uh, is do do we have a is that question on the initial application? Is there a ban the box on our application as local government? We've been engaging in the interview process quite a bit, but that's not that doesn't usually involve me looking at the application. I can pull up one of our most recent. Well, why, why, why don't you plan that for next month? That'd be fine. Don't 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 go out of your way. Um, I always I, I I really feel that the things that we can do as the local government, that's what we should do. Um, and hopefully other people will catch on. So if that is an issue on our applications, maybe that's something we can address and, 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 you know, set that, you know, a good example. So don't go out of your way right now. I'm, I'm okay with that. Well, I have that answer, Commissioner Thornton, because I, I had asked HR about this and it's Judge Hope is who it is. I know you're on the phone, so you can't see me. Um, but we, we um, I emailed or texted Laura Welch about this earlier in the year, and the response I got was, we have a ban the box policy. If we get to the conditional offer stage, they do have to complete a questionnaire and disclose that anything before we run a criminal history and a traffic history. So okay. at the initial application stage, it is not a question that is asked of, of an applicant, is what I've been told by HR. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Wright, we, we've not moved on to any other topics. We realized that we lost you, so we just discussed the ban the box a little bit more. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was. I felt like I was in the star prize. Uh, you know, I was breaking up there. Everybody was. So, uh, But everybody, you guys were all good. It was just mine. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, uh, well, thanks for keeping going forward. And it sounds like we have uh, maybe something to learn about. Does that wrap up what we want to we're doing as a good example on job applications? I believe it does. Um, I think Commissioner Thornton has asked for, for uh, Attorney Hines to go ahead and bring additional information anyway, but we have been able to answer the majority of her questions, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Commissioner Thornton? That, that's, that's correct. Okay. All right. What were, what were some other things that we wanted to clarify? from the committee or staff has ready from the, us last time. Sure. Um, so the other thing that, you know, one of the things that we talked about during the meeting, and I think it's on the agenda for your review is that there are, um, 
setting aside anything we may attempt to do locally, there are resources for individuals who want, who feel that they've been discriminated against to seek uh, help and, and even free help for them. Um, the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, um, their website's there for anybody who feels that they've been discriminated in terms of employment. And certainly with the new Supreme Court case with regards to uh, discrimination against LGBTQ individuals and in employment, that makes their position even stronger um, and, and a better resource for uh, Georgians who feel that they've been discriminated against in that context. And then um, there's a housing link for those individuals who feel that they may have been discriminated with regards to, to housing. Um, so one of the, the comments that I think I had made at the last meeting was just that you know, whatever else we do, there there may be other resources out there for individuals who are better equipped and you are already um, working in this sphere and, and specialize in it um, that we could try to direct people to. And so there was talk at the last meeting about possibly putting that up on our website. And so we wanted to provide those links to you. I know that they're already available, I believe, through HCD, but we thought that I think one of one of the comments was that maybe we would have a a, a page on our website that talks about anti-discrimination and resources, and it could even include a link to our um, application to people who feel that they've been discriminated downtown through the dress code, just to make that more accessible to individuals. Gotcha. And I think, too, that we also were wondering what um, the committee last time, and, and Commissioner Parker, you, I think, had brought up some of these things about wanting to to learn or us move forward in learning how other committee, uh, other municipalities are presenting the opportunity to turn in a complaint. Was that something? Yeah, I guess, I guess my, my question was pertaining to um, trying to get more information about how complaints have been handled in other municipalities. I think the um, information we got back from Sherry was that not a lot of complaints have been brought forward under these other NDOs. And so there wasn't a lot of, I guess, case examples of uh, problems that arose in the process with regards to how this interfaces with state law. And so that's kind of what I was trying to get at. But I think we, I clarified a lot of that with the conversation I had with Sherry after that last meeting. Okay. And I think Ms. Hines, oh, Commissioner Wright, I think Ms. Hines is prepared to share some of that same information with the room, with the rest of the LRC. Uh, she and Judge Hope have had similar experiences. Yes. Okay, and great. Everyone, okay, I'm ready. wants to speak to this, but, um, you know, I tried to reach out to uh, different attorneys or different agencies that were involved in this and, and got universally no response um, or you know, we'll pass your information on and someone will call you and then and no callbacks. Um, and, and I was specifically disheartened to, to get that from Atlanta in the sense that they've been doing this, you know, in theory, the longest of anyone. So I thought surely they would have some information that they could share with us. You know, not not individual details, but just data on, on how many- Sherry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I apologize. Commissioner Wright, it appears that we lost Commissioner Edwards and I don't have a contact number for him. I'm not sure if you want to text him so that he can also hear this. He'd also ask them okay. the same questions that Commissioner Parker did. Let me let me call him up. Thank you. Sorry, Sherry. Thanks for keeping an eye on on the. That was Sarah George. She's multitasking. <laughs> She's the best. Absolutely. Hold that thought, Sherry. He may have wandered off for another reason. I'm not sure. He's, he's not answering. Okay, I'll leave him a text. I guess we should move ahead. We'll catch him up. Oh, he's back. Hey. He's back. There we I go. I reset my router. Sorry about that, guys. That's all good. We wanted, wanted to make sure you heard the update. Go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, so what I was just saying, Commissioner Edwards, because I know you and Commissioner Parker had asked about this, is, is trying to get more information about how this is working in other jurisdictions. And I think Judge Hope and I had similar experiences where, um, and to the extent he wants to talk about it, that you know, we reached out to different uh, entities that we thought would have this information. And we're, I, I at least did not get anyone who was willing to share anything. And, and I was just saying that I was, I was kind of disappointed in the sense that I'd Hope that at least Atlanta would have maybe some historical data that they could share with us, at least just how many applications they may have gotten. Um, and no one was able or willing to share that information with me. 
Um, so, so again, as far as I can tell, it looks like this is used very rarely. Um, you know, I think one of the things we talked about last meeting was that uh, I think it was Decatur and, and one other have only had one or two applications in its entirety. And that's consistent with what we've experienced with our downtown discrimination order ordinance with regards to dress code. Um, so, so I, that's, that's all I have. I don't just hope if you want to speak to what you were able to find out. Yeah, I can. Um, so I, I also reached out to Decatur on the court side of things, as opposed to the county attorney side of things. Um, in Decatur, I was able to able to speak with their clerk of court, and they indicated that they have not had a single complaint that has made it to the court side of the process. Um, I think their uh, ordinance may be one of the ones that has kind of a mediation type of concept in it before things would get to court. Um, but it sounded like they hadn't even had to schedule a mediation because I think that still possibly involved the court at least scheduling that matter. So um, even though they've had an anti-discrimination ordinance in place, it does not look like there's been much activity. Uh, Clarkston, their judge indicated that they do have an anti-discrimination ordinance, but to his understanding, it only deals with discrimination in their hiring practices, either with their own hiring or with contractors that have city contracts. And he has not had any matters actually have to come to his court. And then when I uh, emailed Judge Juana Baker from Atlanta, um, her indication was she had never had such a case come to her court. Atlanta has so many judges. I may try to follow up with them just to make sure. I don't know if they have any subject matter division within their municipal court that maybe they'd all get referred to a different judge. But I think if that were the case, Judge Baker, she's also on the Council of Municipal Court Judges and is usually very, very thorough. I think if she were aware of cases coming to other judges in her court, um, she probably would have said that to me in the email. So at least Clarkston, Decatur, and Atlanta um, reached back out to me, and none of them have had any cases come to the courtroom. Uh, Shambly is the other judge I reached out to, and and I have not gotten a response, but they have one of those jurisdictions where they have a different judge every day, and they have a law practice as well. So I, I probably just need to reach out to them and, and bother them about it a little bit. The, the judge I emailed is usually very responsive. So that that's all I have to report. Hmm. Okay. Thank um, you. May I add just a, a bit of information, Commissioner Wright? Please. Uh, Crystal Coburn, our inclusion officer, has also reached out a bit here more specifically about the complaint process for discrimination and uh, probably a different set of people, but she did reach out to Atlanta a little bit and she contacted one of the people who was involved in coordinating the committee and that person is willing to connect her with some others and share a little bit about their process. This differs slightly, I believe, from what Attorney Hines and Judge Hope had done some research on, but still could ultimately be useful in our uh, final recommendation. So I don't know if you want a little more information from her about that. Uh, it wasn't something that we had on the agenda, but she did share with me that she reached out. She is on a call. Yeah, um, I appreciate um, you looping her in on this. That's um, appropriate for sure. Committee, what are you thinking? Um, I guess I'm not too surprised about the lack of enforcement information. I mean, it, it's unfortunate that we can't get any sort of strategy information from other jurisdictions. I mean, like, hey, we, we haven't quite enforced it robustly yet because it just passed, but here's how we plan to do it or here's our thinking behind it. Um, because based on what I hear so far from Ms. Hines and Judge Hope is just kind of zero. We just enact what we enact and see how it goes, right? And it could be that because of the pandemic, the actual engagement of people for these um, discriminatory events are less happening. I don't know. I don't know. It could be that the, the opportunity for these things to happen are less in this last quarter, two quarters of the year. Well, and, and I think I can maybe offer two things. I mean, one, as we've seen with our own dress code ordinance, um, you know, we may personally want to enforce that as, as as um, zealously as we possibly can, but we cannot do that if people don't come forward. 
Um, I know that our police has really reached out to try to set up stings. And we've had almost no interest in individuals wanting to cooperate with us. Um, so for, for better or worse, uh, you know, it, it requires people to come forward. And on that note, I, I think one thing that, that is sort of been percolating in my mind is that if I were the attorney representing someone who had been discriminated against, I'm mm -hmm. not sure that I would encourage them to go through a local ordinance process where the harshest penalty might be a thousand dollar fine on a business that had discriminated against me because the concern is, as that attorney, is that your client's going to have to get on the stand and testify and face cross examination, and could do something to jeopardize a much larger case. So there may be st trial strategy practices yeah. that are keeping people from filing complaints and pursuing with complaints. I don't do that line of work. It was just something that yeah. sort of con concerned me as an as idea. And it, it probably, if we could get those other jurisdictions to respond and tell us more about the complaint process, and that might be what Crystal knows some more information about. I mean, if, if you have a complaint process that's burdensome or cumbersome or hard to find, that's also going to lead to situations where the courts are never going to know about it. Um, I'm only going to know about a case that comes to my court. If there's a process that doesn't allow it to come to my court for whatever reason, or there's lack of community engagement for whatever reason, as a judge, I'm not going to know that. So that that may be the reason for the responses I'm getting. I got that. Well, I, I do believe um, that not learning how they are pr presenting it, I think you were saying hard to find, but I do believe that our own process for a dress code violation or the, f the private party violations as the examples that we would want to be promoting better, that it in itself is hard to find and hard for people to know how to navigate. So do we want to work on making ours better, uh, presenting information better, and then include the information? Uh, I think, Mariah, that you had specifically asked for that came forward. Do we want to do something with our public interface on this as an, a next step? Or, or what? What, what next steps do we want with the committee? Without any um, insights from other municipalities about how this is operating within their jurisdictions, I mean, are, have we evaluated any potential um, barriers to access with the process that we have outlined thus far? Um, I don't know if um, the, Judge Hope- The closing sure office you know. has. Okay, yeah. I'd love At to least hear about begun this. that process. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Commissioner. No, uh, that's really Parker. fine. Yeah, the inclusion office has begun that process. So what I meant earlier was I believe Ms. Hines and Judge Hope uh, were focused on certain aspects of it, but the inclusion officer was looking at it slightly differently, and she has obtained some information and has... Um, I didn't put her on the agenda, and I don't want to force this on you, but she she does have information that wouldn't catch her off guard if you wanted her to report just a little bit on that. I, I, I apologize that I missed, uh, Deborah, that you said that Crystal was dialed in. I see that now. Shall we hear from her now? Uh, yes, ma'am, if that is the pleasure of the committee. Does that sound good, everybody? Okay. Ms. Coburn? I'm here. Hello. Um, Hi everyone. Um, so the inclusion office um, has been working through, um, there was a, a PowerPoint that was prepared um, by the task force that led to the creation of this office. And one of the um, requests in there um, was looking at discrimination complaint processes across the country. Um, so along with inclusion fellows, we've begun to sort of survey discrimination complaint review processes at the same time as we've been looking into learning more about our existing process. Um, some of the things that we've noticed so far around our existing process is, for example, accessibility. Um, you have to have internet access to find the form. If you get to the form, the form is not fillable, which means that you need to probably have the capacity to print it out, um, fill it in, and then some mechanism for scanning it um, in order to submit it. Um, if you look at the form, the form doesn't necessarily clearly explain what's going to happen next. Um, and if one were a resident who wanted to file a complaint like this, um, there would likely be a lot of um, feelings and experiences and emotions going along with that. 
And if a resident isn't quite sure, okay, so where is this going? Who's going to be reviewing it? What's going to happen next? Um, then that in and of itself could potentially become a barrier. Um, so that's sort of one snapshot um, of the accessibility piece that we've been looking at. Uh, we also started reaching out to various jurisdictions that seem to have a more robust mechanism in place, but more from the angle of understanding uh, what was the process of creating your discrimination complaint review process, because we'd like to learn more about what some of their pitfalls were um, before, you know, we would have come to mayor and commission to recommend a particular approach. Well, that's great information that we are glad you're here to put together and grab from the task force and bring forward. So that clearly some improvements that we need to make on ours for sure. Um, and, uh, Deborah, how do we, how do we move, how do we put all this together for next steps? So I, I thought about that, uh, Commissioner Wright. So the scope of what was assigned to this committee, I think in this case would likely allow us to, to include and encompass these steps for how we better our own processes. But I think the first question, Commissioner, is are we looking actually now to adopt a similar ordinance that Brookhaven has, or is it that we're looking to better our own processes in, in, in hopes or as an example of leading the way for our, low, uh, our private businesses because Brookhaven focused on private businesses. And I think what we're trying to do here is, is different from that. So I think I need a little bit of guidance from the commission uh, based upon the advice and the legal guidance that you've already received. And then the information that's been presented by Ms. Hines, Judge Hope, and now Ms. Colburn. Yeah, that's a good summary and good point of order for what's been assigned to us. Um, tendency to grow our um, topics in LRC, um, but I do believe it is important for us do do the fact that we don't have concrete information to on how others are promoting their process, but we do have clear evidence that ours is should be improved as well. I mean, mine was anecdotal that we only had one uh, successful situation um, punished when we continue to hear that the, these infractions and discriminatory acts are, are happening, continue to happen. Um, should I ask Kelly if, how we wanna handle this junc junction? I think in this case, Mayor, very different from the previous uh, situation. So our assignment reads, examine opportunities for local civil rights legislation modeled on recent Brookhaven ordinance. But that first portion, examine opportunities, I believe gives us the leeway to shift slightly. I don't think we can broaden the scope, but I do believe- right, Mark, you too. You weren't going you, you, you to call my name, were you? I wasn't. It's, I don't even see an M. I, all I see is this little old fashioned phone drawing. I don't even know who you are. Uh, no, I'm good with it. I appreciate all the information everybody's given. So thank you. So, we'll keep, so then we'll keep moving on this topic and we're going to just get fold um, Ms. Colburn in here to continue to help us um, with our interface, I had had this grand idea that we could have a awesome kiosk downtown that allowed people to, you know, upload pictures of an infraction and be able to see what the process was as well as um, submit certain things on the time that this happens and they would get, a, you know, some more engaging at the time um, of a discrimination downtown. And, and would loop them into a better interface with where it went. But um, I like, there's clearly more to it than just finding a kiosk as an improvement. Yes, ma'am. And so I will pull Ms. Coburn in uh, even more and maybe yeah. once she connects with uh, Ms. Hines a bit more and Judge Hope, uh, we'll be able to present a more detailed report next time, but I know that she already has some good, useful information that once fleshed out, this committee would be able to uh, 
uh, utilizing this decision making process for what we do next. Right. And it sounds like going back to the task force that was set up, um, which I think is before uh, the committee members, except for Mike and I, or um, commissioners, uh, that, that even bringing forward what that task force found when um, for that PowerPoint is going to be a refresher for two of us and new information for everybody. Um, if that's if that's still a valid uh, starting point or for us to learn from. Yeah, that won't be a problem at all. We have that readily accessible. Okay. Um, what other information does staff have that's here to share with us based on what we asked for? Have we covered everything? Sherry, did you have anything else? No, I, th I think that covered everything that I had to have, although I'm happy to ask, answer any additional questions. <laughs> We will need to know if you want these links that were provided on the agenda, in addition to the, the form that Ms. Hines mentioned and that Ms. Coburn has identified as needing more work. Do you want those three items available on our main ACC Gov website? Because we would have to take that before the commission. And that's not necessarily something we do separately from the entire recommendation, but I would like to know if you think that's something worthwhile. I my my first idea on that would be that we would have to consult with Jeff Montgomery on, on the placement of that. What's the mm -hmm. committee think? Russell, what do you what do you think? Russell. I agree. I with you, Alan. Yeah, I agree bringing Jeff on. He's got good ideas about that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing too, let's not forget about um, what we have on the books that's related to public not harassing our employees. Is that not relevant? To me, that's really relevant to what we're talking about here too. And so it could be that we, we, I think we should learn what we have on the books so that we don't have people in boards, authorities, and commissions potentially um, overstepping their boundaries with staff. We don't want um, harassment in the public interface. And um, I think that that's also relevant to be projecting in this topic. What do you guys think? Um, I'm a little confused. Um, maybe I missed something about how that directly relates to the ordinance currently up for discussion, but... If well, you want more information about that, I'm not opposed to hearing about it. Yeah, well, um, Deborah, do you want to speak to some, well, well, it piggybacks a little bit about what we were talking about with the bus drivers the other night yeah. at the work session. And then Deborah, can you give her some highlights or some feedback about what's happening downtown to some of our um, staff? Yes, ma'am. And Sherry, feel free to jump in here. Earlier in the year, um, January, we received some information from our solid waste director, uh, Suki Jansen, that one of her newest hires experienced some outright discrimination downtown. And we'll say allegedly, because I don't know that there's been any investigation into this fully. And so he, he was disturbed. He's a new hire, fairly young. And the allegation was that some patrons of a bar um, used derogatory language towards him and so you know he reported this to his supervisor and it ultimately made its way to miss jansen and she was very concerned and she called a staff meeting of all of her um, night shift staff that did the same type of work and and learned that this was actually quite common amongst white patrons downtown and black acc gov solid waste staff and that was very alarming to her. And so she did inform the attorney's office, the manager's office, and police. And the police were able to provide guidance and some assistance and some directions, very specific direction on their willingness to address this, that this is not behavior that's acceptable and they certainly don't have to just take it. Staff was under the impression that because this had been the norm for them, that there was nothing anyone could do about it. Ms. Hines also provided some legal advice and um, I don't know if, if Chief Sproul or Ms. Hines wants to add anything, but evidently that's something that had been going on for, for years. And but for the younger, newer employee kind of refusing to take that behavior, 
it probably would not have come to Ms. Jensen's attention. Yeah, I will add that there are um, uh, there are laws on the book that prohibit certain types of behavior, but it would all depend on exactly what's being said and, and how the person approaches. And so the biggest um, thing that we said is make sure that you immediately call, uh, you know, report it to the police so we can document and investigate it and follow up on it. That's right. And, and I think I just wanted to reiterate that there are no new laws, I think, that we necessarily need to pass to address this because we already have a responsibility as a government or as, as an employer to protect our employees and to make sure that they're not in an unsafe or hostile work environment. Um, and, and that go that does include the public. It's not just making sure that like a supervisor isn't hostile to their underling. It, it's that we are protecting our employees because we're putting them in that position. Um, and so that was one of the things that we met was to talk with Suki about now that we know this problem, what are some ways that we can address it? I think she rules right that it can be a little complicated to enforce these things because if it's someone, as an example, who just is driving by in a car and it throws out a racial epithet, it's, it's maybe hard to, to catch that person or prosecute that person. But there were things that we explored with the police department. I think they came out and had a meeting with all, their, all of the solid waste staff to talk about ways to document what happens so that we can take action to protect our employees um, while they're out, you know, doing their jobs. That makes sense. Yeah, and, and when I think about that and I think about the witnesses and, and the, the, the it's almost along the teaching people about bullying, you know, when you watch see bullying, somebody could be videotaping this totally inappropriate thing, but not know what to do with that information. And my thought was that if we promoted what we have on the books, that we would enhance the video footage that could come from it, whether it be our surveillance cameras or the shocked uh, other patrons that are downtown who see it and would want to turn it in on behalf of the worker. Maybe not there, maybe they, they, maybe they feel intimidated at the time, but they certainly would want to turn it in. So that's why I thought this was worth grouping with their um, information to share and know and, and share how to turn it in. Mariah, that's what I was thinking. Gotcha. Is everybody okay with us having making sure that we're learning about this at the same time and making sure we promote it with the other things we find and want to share? I'm good. Okay. All right. Well, let's we're we're into the wrap up time on this topic. We definitely want this to be at the, our, our next meeting, right? Yeah. Everybody, that's going to be August, whatever the third Thursday is in August. Um, we have things on the future consideration. We have traffic calming, neighborhood traffic management. That was coming out of the corridor committee assigned last December. We have lead certifications, been here since January of 2019. Um, and then we have special events. I think that that one's definitely on the back burner since we're not having special events downtown. Minimum drink pies, I think, is really back, back, back burner. Um, and then we have the multi-use vehicle path. I don't think the staff has on that, that being relevant. Does a committee member want us to... Um, make make a recommendation on whether we just stick with this one topic or do we want to add lead or the traffic calming in? Let's get this one moving forward. Traffic calming? No, no, let's focus on where we're, what we got on, on, on deck right now. Okay. Keep, keep with one topic until we nail right. it down? Right. Okay, what does everybody else think? Agreed. Yeah. It's fine with me. All right, then. Okay. So then we'll do that. And if everybody just continues to keep their eyes and ears out for the topics um, and be ready to study and keep moving this forward. If anybody finds anything out there that's a good example uh, from somewhere else, let's share it. And I guess... Commissioner I'm right. The yes. next date is August 20th at 1 o'clock. I just want to confirm that that is what you want to, us to keep on the books, August 20th at one o'clock. 
Um, I it look to me. Does any I don't see. Is one o'clock still going to be okay? I think I thought there was a time, but Mike and Russell that ADDA was at this same time or close to. Are we okay with this being your everybody's schedule? One o'clock Thursday. Thir um, uh, ADDA. Yeah, hang on. Let me think. When our meeting is in August, I can't remember Allison right off the top of my head. Well, it, it might be that since you don't have to physically go from one meeting to this meeting and you're just you're dialing in, it might be that it's not such an attendance. Right. Because we've had, we've had full attendance uh, these last two times, so I'm, I think this is working for everybody. Okay, then I'm looking for Deborah, yes, the 20th. Looks good. Um, Thank you. And we'll confirm that we have a form when it gets closer. Thanks, everybody, and I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved. So moved. Second. A second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Right. aye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot, and glad to add you and Crystal. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you, Commissioner Wright.